Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we're going to get a little technical. I know, I'm sorry, but I promised my listeners I would try and teach you all something. So here goes nothing. Today, we are going to talk about the North American Industry Classification System, also known as NAICS. This is something I learned back in high school, and let me tell you, a jolt of forgetting my locker room code just hit me. Okay, back to education. What is NAICS? Why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? NAICS is the standard used by the federal statistic agencies in classifying business establishments for the purpose of collecting, analyzing, and publishing statistical data related to the U.S. business economy. Wow, that is a mouthful. Let's try to break it down. So when you think of manufacturing, NAICS thinks of the sector 31 through 33 of the NAICS digital code, and it gets very specific. For example, Manufacturing food for humans, code 311, is not the same as manufacturing food for animals, code 3111. But manufacturing dog and cat food, code 311111, is not the same as manufacturing other animal food, code 3111119. And therefore, NAICS was developed under the Office of Management and Budget, and adopted in 1997 to replace the Standard Industry Classification SIC system. It was developed jointly by U.S., Canada, and Mexico to allow for high level of comparability in business statistics among the North American countries. The key here is this was established to compare business statistics across North America. Now, why is that important, especially to an entrepreneur? Because companies also rely on NAICS codes to classify their own customers by industry. Many target their own marketing efforts to businesses within a particular NAICS code, including entrepreneurs. NAICS codes allow an entrepreneur to focus efforts on companies in similar or identical industries. By acquiring NAICS information, one can gain a better understanding of their best customer and the industries that might best benefit from their products and service. Every business you will start will need an NAICS code, which also creates a bit of an issue. As an entrepreneur, try to avoid high-risk NAICS codes. Automotive sales, the travel industry, restaurants, real estate. These NAICS are considered high-risk because success in these industries is difficult. There are also high-risk industries that are subject to stricter underwriting guidelines, such as the computer and software-related services, general contractors, gasoline stations and convenience stores, to name a few. Choosing the incorrect NAICS code could also end up costing the business money. But there are some benefits. Federal contracts for small business administration certified businesses, incentive plans and tax incentives to various industries, lending services, Remember, high risk equals higher interest rates and other benefits. As an entrepreneur, is it important to know NAICS codes? It will help understand the market you plan to enter, who the competitors may be in the industry, and other important insight. So, what are you waiting for? Grab yourself a glass of something to drink, pull up a chair, and start searching the NAICS database in an industry that you are interested in. Who knows? It may help spur the next entrepreneurial idea. the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. design and blending traditional art techniques with modern technology. His experience ranged from graphics to accessories, apparel, footwear, and color design. He is a father, a designer, and the founder of Burnside Knives. Please welcome Rick Madaris. Rick Madaris. Rick, how are you doing? 
Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming by. Very interested about knives because I'm a big knife guy, you know, grew up on the farms, but these are very unique because they're Burnside knives. So it's, it's, it has a local feel, but first let's introduce the world to Rick. Who is Rick? Oh boy. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, Rick is a human being located in Portland, Oregon. Um, oh man, that's a tough one. Who is Rick? Uh, <laughs> I'm a, a, a son, a brother, a friend, uh, a a dad first and foremost, and I'm a guy who just has uh, no quit when nice. it comes to building things. So, so knives. Where, where did where did you start knives? How did that come? How did it come about? Knives for me started out as a. Um, it, it's always been a tool for me. Um, my grandfather had a pocket knife throughout his entire life, and gave me a little pocket knife as a kid. And, you know, some kids get, you know, slingshots and what have you. I was fortunate enough to get a pocket knife. And it wasn't until I became a, you know, an actual professional in the world of sportswear and things that um, the idea of a pocket knife became something that I wanted to actually build for my own and not just buy somebody else's. You know, and I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm opening up the pocket knife right now, guys, and I'm, I'm just for the listeners at home. This thing is sweet. Like it's so light and it's so like, uh, so let's, let's kind of talk about the knives. Why knives? You, you mentioned you kind of grew up doing knives, kind of have a passion for it. Where did the concept come from? How did it, how did it all start? Originally the concept came from a hashtag. I'm old enough to remember when (laughs) Instagram started. And I remember that Instagram was a way to connect people across the world very quickly. That was the cooler version of, say, Facebook. Okay. And through the usage of hashtags, you can connect with people or see photographs of things that people were interested in by just using a hashtag as kind of like a, a geo marker or a pin location, if you will, uh, a hashtag. And um, I saw that people were uh, using hashtags for sneakers. And somewhere along the line, I saw sneakers of the day and Mm, then sneakers of the day was truncated into KOTD. Now, Portland is the home of all of the largest cutlery manufacturers in the world. You have the largest companies here and an abundance of them. Mm -hmm. So whereas a lot of people might think about Portland as like Multnomah Falls or Voodoo Donuts or so on and so forth. For me, when I think about Portland, I always thought about sneakers and I always thought about pocket knives because to me, those were the biggest things here. Mm. So through Instagram, I started finding images of people tagging their shoes and somewhere I saw the KOTD pop off into my head where it was like, well, it could be knife of the day. Mm, Yes. And so through the knife of the day, I could possibly create a pocket knife tag it and then when it's popping up in people's feed they might see something that might change an algorithm and through that i could possibly create a a brand and um so on and so forth so so what what goes into making a knife there's a lot i mean there's different ways to really break down a pocket knife there's uh taking a billet and doing flat stock removal and making a fixed blade there's actually designing and engineering um, movable parts for like a folding pocket knife. Um, there's even, you know, aspects of um, taking old files or bushcraft mentality of creating something. So it's a very interesting and complex system on how to make an actual knife. For me, I started out by, I did what a lot of people do when they're first starting out where they would take a uh, you know, custom materials or what they thought would be custom or combinations. And they would put them onto blanks or already established blades. From there, um, I got into movable parts and drafting and designing and working with engineers and modelers and things of that nature. And so I'm currently focusing on uh, folding pocket knives, but I started out with, you know, handles and pre-made blanks. And then from there making fixed blades, um, and then quickly, you know, moved up the chain to working on foldable folding pocket knives. Nice. Now you, you kind of briefly talked about the brand. Let's talk about how this business created. Is this an LLC, S Corp, C Corp? It's an LLC. Um, I've thought about going into creating it as an S Corp, um, creating any 
brand or business, you always have to think about an exit strategy. Yep. I wanted to create a brand that first and foremost, I wanted to create a brand that I thought I could be proud of, my friends and family could be proud of, but I also didn't want to race to the finish line. I believe that any good tool company needs to have longevity. You need to have time on the books with tools. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not fast fashion by any means. Um, I have pocket knives still till this day that I had when I was a boy. And I know that there are people that still have hammers and things in their drawers that they've had or have had been passed down to them. And so for me, I wanted to create a brand that had legs, that had longevity and um, thought about it from that manner. And so I started out with an LLC, wanted to see if the brand could actually take off. And then from there, um, you know, applied for a trademark and um, just recently got incontestability on my actual trademark. Nice. So after five years, the uh, slogan, your knife says a lot about you is permanent. Uh, It's not going away. And um, I do see a future of it becoming an S corp and perhaps an exit strategy later on down the road. But for now I'm still in the midst of trying to fulfill that vision of what I want the brand to look like as a whole. Right now you've worked in corporate America before you were an entrepreneur, correct? Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that because I would love to hear how your previous career helped kind of your current career. So what did you do previously? Strange enough. Um, My entrepreneurial ship, if you will, um, started with me going to school, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I originally was studying sociology and I had an interest in architecture and it sounds crazy, but when I realized that only 3% of all architects could ever put their name onto a building, (laughs) it really put it put a bitter taste in my mouth and I was hanging out with a buddy of mine and, you know, decided that I was going to head down to the local Jamba Juice, if you will. And, and I saw a flyer on the wall and it was for an artist assistant at the Catholic church. I was down in San Luis Obispo at the time. So I called my family and I said, there's an opportunity for me to actually work with a mural painter, restoring a mission. I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to do this because I can be a working artist, get paid free food. And this guy has a lifetime appointment working for the church. Yeah. And what am I going to do with school that I'm not, you know, it was just kind of a really, it was a really uh, uncharted journey at that moment because I was studying. I liked school and I still love education till this day, but I saw an opportunity to try something different. That was radically different. Like, you know, you work hard, you go to school, you get good grades, you're in college. And then all of a sudden you have an opportunity to, do something that you eventually would love to do, which would be painting. Mm -hmm. And so my parents were kind of freaked out. They're like, (laughs) you're dropping out of school to do this. I'm like, but wait, I'm going to work for a church and paint. They're like, uh, so I did that for uh, about 10 and a half months. And my dad who uh, retired military, my mom retired district attorney's office. And they said, you know, this, I remember them saying, I, to me that they're like, you know, this kid's got an entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, I was a kid that had a little lemonade stand and made t-shirts and sold them to my friends, so on and so forth. But, um, they're like, he's really falling for design and illustration and painting. Let's support it. And so I never thought that my dad would be interested in me going to art school. You know, he's like, work hard, take care of your family, get up and do it all over again, which is the same mentality that I have today. Yeah. Um, but where things kind of changed course a little bit was, Hey, why don't you think about going back to school? You can do this, but you should really get an education. And I thought he was right. And so he brought up the idea of graphic design. And so I know we talk about, you know, how was your career and what have you, but that career started dropping out of college, working for a church, restoring a mission, taking that money and actually paying for art school. So from there, did my internship with a fantastic agency in the city called Nemo Design. And then afterwards, I got into screen printing. So I moved back to California. I'm originally from Hollister, California. Yep. Grew up on a cattle ranch, very agricultural based. And um, went back to California, got into uh, screen printing, applied for a job at New Era Baseball Hats. Oh, nice. 
Very cool. Got a couple of those. Yeah, me too. And it was right (laughs) around the time, um, it was right around the time or just thereafter when Spike Lee had worn the red Yankees hat. Oh yeah, and everybody's like, "Yo, I've never seen this before. What is this?" And all Fred about? Durst started wearing it, and everybody started wearing it after that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a big thing to actually change up team colors mm-hmm. for your for your uh, your particular sport or your fans or what have you. And so I got a job as a product graphic designer. Flew out to New York, stayed there for a little while, worked with some fantastic designers, um, then moved to Irvine, California, and I was a product designer there making hats for action sports. I did that for a couple of years and that's where the aperture really opened up because I was doing graphics and headwear and things like that. I had a screen printing background, had earned a degree in graphic design from the Art Institute. And when I got a chance to meet people in the uh, action sports and streetwear world, it really changed the course of my life. Without New Era, I don't know if I'd even be in the position I was at today. Meeting so many different people that had so many entrepreneurial spirits that they worked in these big companies, but they also had their own brands. So after a couple of years of doing that, I um, was offered a job at O'Neill, which is a surf company. Mm -hmm. And I was a senior graphic designer there. I did that for a very short amount of time. Having grown up in Hollister, Santa Cruz isn't far away. But I was down in Irvine and the clothing brand and what I knew of the brand growing up being, you know, in the South Bay area seemed very indifferent. Um, For me, it was a fantastic opportunity, but it just wasn't really the vibe that I wanted. Gotcha. So I stepped out of there and opened up a little small studio where I was just a freelancer. I took on a gig as an art director for a small brand, which then we sold to Body Glove. Um, got a chance to work with uh, Travis Barker and his famous Stars and Straps brand as a as a freelancer and then as a designer on his team and got to work with a beer company called Hinano. And so I was just hustling after I had left. So I felt kind of as though I went through having all of the grooming to become a professional graphic designer, but I wanted to do something besides what I saw all my peers doing. And so I went for the big moonshots every time, like I'd apply for these jobs. Shoot, I think I had maybe four or five interviews with Nike and they're like, you have too much experience in all these different areas. We need a specialist. Mm. And I had applied for a job at Adidas while I had my little design studio and they hired me on the idea that I could do a lot of different things. I could do tech packs and illustration. I could draft so on and so forth. And along that you know, journey, I was able to really find something that I thought was kind of fun. And I give a lot of praise to my grandparents and my parents and family and friends was storytelling Mm. because the storytelling aspect was really the heart and soul of being able to create a product. You can have a cool baseball hat, but if you change the color and can tell a reason why it does something more, right? Yeah. That's a great point. And so, um, from creating, I don't know, like all these different offerings for these different companies. Um, I landed at Adidas and that was when I just fell in love with sneakers and fell in love with the idea of a merchandising plan and creating inline initiatives and city packs and so on and so forth. And I really wanted to do something more. I was a graphic designer working on apparel and t-shirts and footwear and, um, for me, it was, it was great, but I really wanted to get into footwear and I didn't get a chance to, because we already had everybody on the team that could do that. And so I thought to myself, well, I want to create something for myself that it wasn't like a weird, like God or a hero complex. It was a, something that was just itching at me that I needed to create something. And I wanted to create something useful for other people, but I also didn't want to direct them into subscribing into something that could just be a seasonal drop. Mm. I wanted something that can have long withstanding, you know, uh, peace of mind, if you will. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of how you then created the Burnside brand, right? Yeah. So how did it start? Was it a grassroots funding? Did you kind of just out of pocket or did you have to go venture capital route? No, it's a grassroots the entire way. Um, although 
I did receive a check from my grandfather when I first started because he was, I mean, we would talk about pocket knives and stuff and, and he always had like a, a little pocket knife on him at all times. And I remember telling him that I really liked the idea of creating a brand. I mean, like some of my favorite pocket knives are the, some of everybody else's favorite pocket knives, but I wanted to create something unique and we would talk and, you know, he was kind of my chief counselor on a lot of things like, Hey, what do you think about this? And why would I want to create something like that? And why do you carry the one that you carry? Right. And so that became almost like a Q and a for a lot of people and growing up around people that were in construction and ranching and so on and so forth. Um, I started asking people really like, why do you carry a pocket knife? I did it just the same as anybody would ask me, why would you create a brand? And what I found was a common thread that people wanted to carry something that they could rely on something that they felt like it was just a tool. They didn't really think about it, but for some reason within that, I thought that there was a way to connect with other people. And so I came up with the phrase we were, I was talking to my grandfather and I came up with the phrase, your knife says a lot about you next to the rock hammer. It's our oldest tool thinking about it across the globe. Knives are important in every culture. And it's true. They're important to men, women, doesn't matter like how old you are, yeah. what color you are, it doesn't matter. Pocket knives are synonymous with cooking and with utility and so on and so forth. And the name Burnside came across because I was driving across Burnside Bridge, headed to work at Adidas, and I was on the phone with my grandfather and I was like, you know, nobody's claimed the name Burnside. And when you Google it and he's like, let's well, Google, you know, I mean, old school cowboy guy. Yeah. I was like, you know, people find Multnomah falls and they find the yeah. skate park and they find the coffee shops and they find all the different things about Portland. Um, but Burnside always pops up in the top. And I think I can leverage people searching because it's a good tourist attraction yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, that I could create a brand that can be, you know, a, a little weird, a little safe, a little something in the middle, I guess. Yeah. Adventure outdoors meets, you know, everybody else. <laughs> That's Portland in a nutshell right there. <laughs> no, it really is. And it has such a diverse collection of personalities and types of people. But at the end of the day, everybody loves the outdoors. It doesn't matter if you're a fashionista or you're a hardcore adventurist. We all love the outdoors and we all want to take care of it. And we all need tools when we're doing these things. And so I wanted to create a brand that I thought could do that. And funny enough as it is, Burnside was the first street that brought east to west for commerce in the city. It was originally yeah. like B Street. Yep. For me, I thought about it in the aspect of east to west globally. Mm. The mentality of like learning something from somebody else or contributing back to a greater meal, if you will. Yeah. And so started digging into Burnside and thought to myself, all right, that's pretty cool. And then for some reason, it just, it was like a light bulb going off that um, Burnside, the person, it was a really, it was a tough one for me to, to digest, but I found a little bit of harmony in the fact that you had, uh, you had General Burnside, who was the first president of the NRA, mm. but also fought to free slaves. That's an unlikely comment you never think about, <laughs> but right. it's great to know. Was a poet and a writer and had patents and was a designer, if you will. Yeah. And so for me, I was thinking, okay, well, I love all these aspects of Portland and its uniqueness. Right. But then here's this other little egg or this little Easter egg, if you will. And I was like, well, okay. So on one aspect, I can actually fulfill the idea of your knife says a lot about you with people that are into different things. But then on the same side of it, I can focus this towards taking a narrative that, I mean, l l I'll just be straight up with you. I'm not really into the things that are fed to us and gun violence is a really horrible thing in the world. Right. I'm not a I proponent agree. of it. Yeah. I mean, offline, I have my own opinions about a lot of this stuff, but when I really broke it down, I thought, okay, pocket knives are cool because it's personal. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be a pretty special person to actually carry a pocket knife or deal with something like that. That, and at the end of the day, it's like a handshake or bowing. It's, it's hand to hand. 
And I didn't want to focus on the idea that so many pocket knives are synonymous or paired up with the firearms community. Mm, Yeah, totally. So I wanted to try to rewrite the narrative with that, to be perfectly honest with you. And so I thought, well, here's this really interesting character in history that has a very unique position. Yeah. The name is strong. The name is cool in itself. And it also has a really interesting depth to it within the city. And so I was like, well, you know what? I I mean, I'm not a Burnside. My last name's Medeiros. But I thought that if I was going to be inspired by a name, that there's two really interesting bookends of what that could mean to somebody. For me, I wanted it to go right into the middle. Yeah. And right in the middle would be, you know, creating an outdoor brand that's essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals. Yeah. Now let's let's talk about the brand a little bit because we were we were kind of talking about earlier and and even though you're trying to create a new narrative for brands, you're still for the knives, you're actually still running up to the old narrative when it comes to actually promoting your brand, right? And now let's let's talk about your brand and, and how you're trying to grow it. And then not only that, how had the corporate world kind of helped you build this brand? So first, let's talk about the brand, how you began to build Burnside Knives, and what are the things that you're kind of running up against? When I first started the brand, I wanted to create pocket knives that were, I started looking into OEM. So original equipment manufacturing. I thought that I could take my designs, work with the manufacturing house because I didn't have all the equipment at the time. Right, right. The first knives that I made, I made in my dad's machine shop to be able to produce the volume that I needed to create. I was going to have to staff people. EPA licenses were through the roof. It was not originally set up to be, manufacture that that and I was going to have to move to California and do all of that in my dad's shop and so what I did was I started actually looking up OEM and I started to send out my designs both in the United States and overseas and make prototypes and samples I would buy steel figure out exactly you know itemize everything down to the screw how much would it cost to package it looked at the entire you know what what would this final product cost me? And then how can I sell it at a reasonable price so I can have the business move forward, but also not price gouge anybody? Because we all know how much things cost in this world. Yeah. And so what I did was I started taking from my experience as a working, you know, designer to start thinking about packaging and materials and the aesthetic at the very end of it. But that came after thinking about mechanism and use and why would you want to have something? It's great to have beautiful aesthetics. There are some brands out there that focus solely on aesthetics or a mixture of both, if you will. A lot of my first knives and even some of the ones now, they're they're not really fancy. They're not, you know, some people think they're show pieces. I personally don't. I think they're tools. Um, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to take from those experiences on How do you create a collection? What does it look like from the top down as your, you know, star on the Christmas tree or or high price point item? And then what would be your most budgeted piece that still can fit within the entire offering that people can say like, well, I can't afford the Ferrari, but I'm super happy with the truck. Right, right. And now you, one of the things you mentioned too, um, because knives are kind of synonymous with weapons, right? Sadly. Branding, you kind of run into some issues with that, correct? I do, yeah. Unfortunately, because of the way that people abuse tools and honestly, they abuse one another and the way, honestly, we treat one another holistically. Sadly, yes. It's terrible. Um, Knives are considered weapons. I've always thought about them as tools. Where I run into issues with this is that I can't advertise this brand on social media, specifically through Instagram and Facebook, which are humongous platforms yeah. for shopping. Yep. Um, so this brand has been built off of word of mouth and through trade shows and being the weirdo at the gun and knife show. That's <laughs> like, Hey, I have a skateboard tool, you know, yeah. and things of that nature. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm really grateful for the people that have actually given me the time of day to look at what I've been doing 
and see the brand for what it is because it's a brand. Right. I do design tools, but as a whole, it's a brand. Um, I have a bartender tool that I've been working on, a pen, um, a skateboard tool, and then an assortment of folding pocket knives. And then there is a small assortment of soft goods and accessories because it is a brand and I want to promote it from that lens. Yeah. Now it sounded like this, this may not be your first business, right? You kind of mentioned previously you sold one to body armor. What other businesses have you done? I've created a number of them. I mean, the first one was a little lemonade stand as a kid. (laughs) I love it. I think the neighbors (laughs) and my mom were the uh, best customers. Um, And, you know, I, I've, I remember some jokes with my folks talking about it and they're like, you know, I remember, or they said that they remember telling me, they're like, you know, you could buy a cup of lemonade for 25 cents, but you are the kid that said, Hey, if we sell it for like 50 cents, we could buy more, you know, pre-mix and we can make even more and what have you. And (laughs) I always thought that was cute. I don't know if that's exactly true or maybe I was having a bad day and they're like, Hey, you know, just stick with it. Um, but I've created a, a really funny side brand that was just pure comedy. Do you remember the store at the mall called Spencer's? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I created a brand now. You know, I'm gonna drop a I'm gonna drop a foul language here. So if there's any <laughs> little kids around, you know, hit the button now. I created a brand called Good Job Fuckface. <laughs> I gotta hear more about this. <laughs> And good job, fuck face was my way to be a free graphic designer. Like I had the, uh, the foam thumbs up as the logo. Nice. nice. I had bubble letters <laughs> and I made stickers. I made skateboards and lighters. I made condoms and gave them out to people. Um, and that was a, a little business that I had created that I wanted to just, you know, kind of sell myself. I thought that if I can hook people through smiling and laughter, (laughs) they would want to like see what's underneath the hood and then see my portfolio. Um, I created a a business with a previous partner and um, stepped aside from that, Um, worked as an art director for a surf brand and that got sold to a body glove. Um, I've done a couple of things for other people where I've had a hand in helping them create their business and was just like an advisor, a graphic designer. The first one I ever did was a lemonade stand and then doing the good job fuck face. And, and, uh, the first time I actually like had a business license was with Burnside knives. Nice. So you've, you've have some experience. You've been doing it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. What advice would you have a younger entrepreneur, someone that's coming into the business that, Hey, avoid these mistakes. Watch out for these potholes. I would say first and foremost to any young entrepreneur, secure your name and secure all of the uh, intellectual properties or IP that you need so that whether or not your business has an upward trajectory pretty quickly or not, that you actually can secure your namesake, if you will. So getting a business license, making sure that you have your Gmail and social media names taken care of. I mean, across the board from Instagram to Twitter, to Gmail, to Facebook, all of those things. Um, and then also to a young entrepreneur, you're going to have highs and lows and those moments where you feel like you might quit or that it's just too much or after the highs and lows of, you know, the popularity kind of simmers out, stick with it because that's probably when the magic is about to happen. Yeah. You hear that a lot with people, but it's very true. And I know that from my own experience, I wanted to quit, you know, three times already this morning, (laughs) you know, and, and I realized that I've had a lot of experiences like that, that have then turned into fantastic conversations, new connections, new ideas, but they still focus back on the original intent, but really knowing, you know, is this a passion project? Is this something that is just about you and an art experiment or is this an actual business? And knowing that up front, is the biggest thing. And that's why I didn't name it Rick's knife company. Yeah. Makes so sense. I think that would probably be my best advice. Secure your name, secure all of your IP, make sure that, you know, you spend the time reading these books. There's so much free information out there. Yes, there is. Yes. That it's fun to think about, you know, putting the frosting on the cake, but you really got to know how to like either procure the ingredients to make your mix or to bake something properly before you get to the frosting in the, you know, glamour shots. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole and realize, well, 
screwed up. Got to turn around. Because it's really expensive. <laughs> it's really think. expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so what advice would you have for yourself for a younger Yik? I think that that would be the best advice I would tell myself. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have the experiences that I did in my professional life to know that those things are crucial. Yeah. Um, on top of that, I would say be patient, continue to be diligent, and know that the people that you have around you, one of the things that you don't hear a lot of entrepreneurs talk about is that a lot of the times you meet people in the beginning of a journey that will show their cards. They'll want something way too soon. Like I remember working with a kid that I wanted to bring him on to Burnside, wanted market share up front, wanted like, uh, he wanted like stake in it. I'm like, dude, I don't even have shares, right. you know, it's like, wanted like a percentage of sales. I'm like, I'm going to pay you like an independent contractor because that's, I mean, I'm still doing that for myself. Right. Right. And I I would love to be able to offer healthcare and everything right off the get go, but I'm still in a building phase. I took almost two years off to take care of other things. And knowing that separating, if you will, church and state, your family time versus business time is very, very important. Being able to separate the idea that this is what I'm going to do from nine to five and at that lunch hour or every couple of hours, I need to be conscious about taking a water break or turning off the phone and being present. And those are really important things that I don't think a lot of people address because being an entrepreneur, the clock doesn't stop. And you will wake up depending on where you're manufacturing. I mean, I manufacture all over the world. Nobody is going to stay up and wait for my email. Yeah. And so being conscious of like your health and your water intake and your time with your friends and family, um, you know, socially distanced now, but is really crucial because when it's go time and you're working on your projects, um, that's when you have time to focus on that. But if it bleeds into the other, it can make a really, really tough life. Yeah. You yeah. can get those gray hairs pretty early. You know, it's kind of funny. You said this morning before you got here, I, I legit woke up. I'm like, shit, it's noon. I missed my podcast. Like I'm supposed to be working. And I'm like, wait, it's, it's five 30 in the morning. Yeah. But that's what you do as entrepreneurs. You kind of wake up because a lot of these tasks that go undone, you're the only one it. Yeah, I'm the one doing it. I got to I got to do it. If I if it if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Right? Kind of thing. Right. And one of the things you hear often is the loneliness sometimes of being an entrepreneur. What would you say is the hardest part about starting the business? I would say the loneliness is hard. At the end of the day, you are gambling on ideas. And these ideas can sway somebody to be really interested or really turned off really quickly. Yeah. And having a tight circle of people that you can trust or bounce ideas off of is crucial. Um, Unfortunately, being an entrepreneur is very lonely. There are times where you are betting everything either on black or red, if you will. Yeah. And you don't know how it's going to turn out until it actually comes out. Before that, like making pocket knives, like it takes time to do that. If I believe in a product or something, it might be a couple of months before that thing comes out and before it even hits retail. And so with that in mind, being conscious of the fact that it's it's important to to have a group of peers to be able to bounce ideas off of right. people that you can trust, whether they're going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, um, interested in signing an NDA. That's totally on you and their relationship with you. Um, but yeah, I would say that loneliness, that that's, that's, that's tough. That's yeah. Tough. I, I sometimes feel it. I and mean, I feel like, you know, my entrepreneurial journey is very, very, uh, immature at this point, right? I'm just kind of pretty certain. I started this podcast a year ago, you know, had a clothing line that didn't pan out. I'm still learning it, right? And hearing these stories and then having those moments, those nights, like when you're down here editing or doing something solo and you're like, now I see what they're talking about. Yeah. (laughs) So for the folks at home, again, I'm holding one of these knives and I got to tell you folks, these things are sweet. I will try to do an Instagram reel if they let me post it because I know (laughs) why I think it's a weapon. How can the folks at home get these knives? Where can they look at them online? Where can they find your social media channels? 
through social media, you can find it at Burnside Knives and you can find it on BurnsideKnives.com. Um, there are a couple of little spots here in the city. Um, I'm very fortunate. My very first retailer was Marcus, who has a brand new location downtown and also have some pocket knives at Cord PDX. So both on uh, the west and the east side locally. There are a couple of knives um, on Blade HQ and Knife Center. Um, primarily, you can find Burnside Knives through the BurnsideKnives.com. Perfect. And, you know, funny enough, Marcus, I reached out to them saying like, hey, let's jump on the pod because they just got a new location down in the Pearl. Yeah. So uh, congratulations to them. Yeah. Rick, thank you again so much for being on the show. So informative. For those listening at home, please check out Burnside Knives on the social media channels as well as online. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.